Amen. Well, praise the Lord. Amen. We're going to get into our lesson today. And uh, the theme for the lesson today is Jesus born to redeem. Amen. There was a reason Jesus came to this earth. Amen. And we're going to go into the scriptures that are going to proclaim these wonderful truths that we hold to our heart today as believers in the Bible and believers in Jesus Christ. Yes, you can spread those around. Yes, sir. Amen. First of all, I want to welcome those that are on the web viewing our lesson today. Collierville First Pentecostal Church, we welcome you. And uh, we welcome you to come and sit among us and worship among us. Amen. Because we believe what the Bible says concerning Jesus Christ and everything the apostles taught. And we abide by those principles and those truths today. We are apostolics by faith. We believe the word of God is what it, for what it says. <clears throat> we don't consider it myth. We don't consider taking some scriptures and believing them and discarding others, but we believe in the truth. The truths that Jesus Christ spoke, the truths of the apostles, what they spoke and what they did. And we carry that tradition on today. Our scripture we're going to go to is in Luke chapter 2. <clears throat> well, we're going to start in Matthew. Let me just start in Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verse 21. Then we will go into Luke chapter 2, verse 4 through 11. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 21, the scripture says this, And she shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And we'll get into the talking, breaking down these scriptures. In Luke chapter 2, verse 4 through 11, And Joseph went, also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into <clears throat> uh, Judea, and unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and the lineage of David. To be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in that same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came unto them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were so afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Say amen, everybody. Amen. What scriptures? Powerful scriptures. And uh, we're going to get into breaking them down a little bit and talk about this. This has been expressed and been told, no doubt, through your Sunday school experience. If you were around knee high to a grasshopper until your adult age, you know these scriptures. You've heard these scriptures countless times. And yet, <clears throat> we look at these scriptures as a witness of the truth. Because we need to know the truth. The truth, Jesus, the word of God says, is going to make us and will set us free from all the lies, deception, and the mistruths, half-truths that out, that's out there concerning the Bible. I'm a believer of the Bible. I'm, I teach the Bible. And I really love people who believe the Bible. 
I mean, if you don't believe the Bible, I don't know why you even come to church. But if you believe and are a believer of the Bible, <clears throat> welcome. Amen. To those that welcome the truth, love the truth, and walk in the truth. Our opening statement in Matthew 121 <clears throat> states that there's going to be a son that was going to be born. And <clears throat> the name of that child was not named by Joseph, neither by Mary, but from heaven. The word of the Lord came through the angel and declared that name to be Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Is he just talking about the Jewish people? David was a Hebrew, was a Jew. And Jesus Christ was born from the lineage of David, being a Jew, being a Hebrew. And so what we know is that when we talk about the Hebrew people or the offspring and children of Abraham, that they were a special people. They were a people called by God. And really, when you think about it, they were a miraculous people because Abraham, as we were taught prior to these lessons, was old, old, and so was his wife. And so beyond ch childbearing years, and so these people that were brought forth were special people. But nevertheless, the declaration from the angel of God says it's going to be that we're going to look into it and we're going to see it's all people are going to be involved. I don't care what tribe you're from. I don't care what ethnic background you are. I don't care what color you are. The Lord says to all people. And so we are considered his people when we obey his word. Can you say amen? All right. And so what we have here is going back now probably 700 years before Christ, we go back into the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah. And Isaiah speaks a lot about the oneness of God. But it also has some insight. Of course, Isaiah 53, we talk about the Christ. But here are two particular scriptures that match up and are in unison with the scriptures in the New Testament. The key is New Testament scriptures have to have biblical backing from Old Testament scriptures. And so the prophet says in, in uh, chapter 7 of Isaiah, in verse 14, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which is interpreted what? God with us. And here we see the scripture in the very next couple of chapters. <clears throat> in chapter 9 and in verse 6. For unto us a child is born. For unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder. And his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor the mighty God, the everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, and of the increase of his government and peace, and peace, there shall be no end. And it's upon the throne of David and upon uh, his kingdom to order it and to establish it with judgment and with justice and henceforth even forever, forever the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall perform this. And this scripture, combined with many other scriptures, verify the stamp of approval of this one called Jesus Christ, all right, born in Bethlehem, from the lineage of David. And there are countless scriptures in the Old Testament that give that seal of approval that this is the one. And the, the chances of that happening are impossible, but that's the way God is. God made it so that there wasn't just going to be just a false Christ. 
that's going to get that seal of approval. But there was going to be so many scriptures that verify where he was going to be born, about his life, about his death, about everything about him, countless scriptures, that you will know this is the one. This is the Christ. This is Jesus, amen, whom we seek. And so the child was going to be born from a virgin, and the child was going to be given by God because of God's grace on the human race, and the government is going to be on his shoulders, and his name is going to be, well, I'm going to just express it the way I see it, because we're talking about compound names here. It says wonderful counselor. Why don't we just say wonderful counselor? He's not just a counselor, but he's a wonderful counselor. He's, the, he's not just God. He's the mighty God. He's not just the father, but he's the everlasting father. He's not just a prince, but he's, he's the prince of peace. And so you see in the scriptures how it describes this child. And the one thing that I, I, I find interesting is the title and position of that child is that he's the everlasting father. And you can't distinguish two beings in the Godhead, or three, because God is one. And Jesus said, I and my Father are one. Amen. Brother Blanton understands that. He loves oneness. I love oneness. I think you love oneness. And when we talk about the oneness of God, we're talking about one God. And if he has to do and be what he has to do and be, he will do it. He will be our good shepherd. He will be the mighty God. He will be our shelter. He will be our high tower. He will be anything and everything he has to be for his people. Amen. So just to label him as three, in three positions, no, God is so, he is Elohim. He's glorious. He's awesome. And so you can't just put God in a box. I'm sorry, you can't. The scripture says that his spirit not only is here among us, in us, but his spirit is throughout the universe and beyond the universe. He is, you can't contain him in spirit form. But like God can do, he can appear in form. And God, through the Old Testament, appeared in form, in different types of forms, and, but when it all comes to the peak, the climax of it all, the revealing of God is in the face of who? Jesus Christ. Amen. If you want to know God and everything you want to know about God, you can find in one individual, and that is in the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is God manifest in the flesh. Say amen. Amen. All right, so <clears throat> did Joseph have anything to do with the birth? No, other than raising him, but he had nothing to do with the conception that w- took place in the womb of Mary, his, his espoused wife. The Scripture says an angel appeared to her, and the Scripture says the Holy Ghost, or the Spirit of God, overshadowed her. And what she conceived was of the Holy Ghost. Amen. So what we have here, Adam being the transgressor, and it's named that he is the transgressor in the Scripture, that Adam and his uh, fall and the sin that was plagued among his children, the offspring that we deal with, the fallen race of humanity, that this child was not going to be a part of that fall. This child was unique in that the seed, God just made what he had to make and become in the womb. I think God knows everything about a birth. He designed it. And I think he knows everything about everything because he knows everything. And what I find interesting is that Mary received the announcement from the angel and believed. And though she had questions, no doubt, as a mother, that she was raising a unique child. 
This child was uh, expressed to be one that was going to save his people from their sins. I don't know about you, but I need saving. I need saving. And I need a savior. Now, you can say you don't need a savior, and I question why. Because the race, as you know it, of humanity has fallen. And it so is in a spiral downward. And darkness is upon it. The people that walk in darkness have seen a great light, the scripture says. And where do we see that light? Jesus said what? I am the light of the world. Amen. And that's the truth. Because I'll tell you what, I didn't know anything about truth or, or light or anything until I started getting into the Bible. And the Lord turned the light on in my life. And we can sing like that song says, I saw the light. And the fact of the matter is, we saw the light in Jesus Christ. You can't deny it. You can't ignore it. Because one day you're going to have to stand before him. And whether you're going to uh, accept him or not, that's your choice in this life. But for me, I'll follow him to the day I die. I hope that's for you too. The scripture goes on to say this. That there was a specific place he was going to be born, a specific city of David. And we know that to be true in the Old Testament. It talks about where he was going to be born and talks about it are going to come from uh, the lineage of David. God promised David that from the fruit of, fruit of his womb, uh, that because Mary was involved in that, but Mary was not a transgressor in a sense that she, her seed was all right as a virgin until it made contact with the seed of Joseph. And then the, the children or offspring were going to be fallen, corrupted. Seed is important, understanding that God was very specific with the Jewish people. He wanted them to stay among themselves and have offspring that way. But the fact of the matter is, what is is what is, and what came to pass is that God offered salvation to all people, to the Jews, to the Gentiles. Amen. And I'm thankful for that. All right, so the Scripture goes on to say that it, it was going to be her firstborn son. And some would say the reason that's there is because it, that's the way the Scripture talks about there's something special about a firstborn son. He was supposed to be, uh, well, Brother Blanton, he was supposed to be dedicated to the Lord, right? And uh, so we understand being firstborn in the family, in the offspring, has special privileges. And so... Jesus Christ was the firstborn. If there was a second and thirdborn, we don't know exactly what is involved in that. We can say that, yeah, Mary had children after that. But the fact of the matter is this unique birth was special. It was of God. And God was involved in it, and God was a part of it, and that's how God made his debut in the human race. All through the Old Testament, all through it, we see the ups and the downs of God's people. And it wasn't until the Lord stepped in and fulfilled that high priest position and sealed it, then we were assured of salvation. Because the high priest in the Old Testament, well, they weren't perfect. Let me put it that way. And I won't get into uh, going through all the high priests and all that stuff, but the high priests failed their keep their position. The priesthood failed their position. And the whole Old Testament became Old Testament because a new one was ushered in by the Lord. And the new one is what we live under. And you wouldn't want to live under the old one if you had a choice, would you? If you had a choice, would you like to live under the Old Testament system or the New Testament system? There's no comparison. It is so much better Living for God under the New Testament situation. Uh, so rejoice. Because we've got 
Jesus, our conqueror, our Savior, our God, our wonderful Redeemer, amen, not only around us, not only among us, but to those that believe the truth in us. Amen. Thank God for the Holy Ghost. Amen. Jesus said he's not going to leave you comfortless. He will come back. Amen. Hallelujah. In spirit form and fill you. If you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, mm, it's there for you. But if you're going to believe teachers that say it was only for 2,000 years ago and when Peter preached and during the very beginning, the very beginning of the church, then you're being misled. You're in darkness. The Holy Ghost is falling today just like it fell on the day of Pentecost. Amen? Amen. And so the Scripture goes into saying this, that there was no room for them in the end. It's so heartbreaking, but the fact of the matter is a lot of people don't have room for God in their life. They don't have room in their lives for the Lord. They don't have room in their heart for the Lord. Amen. They would just rather just go their own way and be what they want to be and do what they want to do in life. But the fact of the matter is, if you follow him, there's life, eternal, everlasting life. And not only that, when you live down here, you don't have to live in fear of what governments do. You don't have to live in fear of what the ungodly and lawless humanity will do. But you can trust in God and realize no man can pluck you out of the Father's hand. You might die in the flesh because of martyrdom, but God has you all the way. Amen. And you can, you can just be comforted in that. And you can see all through the New Testament scriptures when the church was being um, afflicted and harassed that in the end they had joy unspeakable and full of glory. They could not kill the church. They couldn't stuff it out. Hell will not prevail. God will prevail. Amen. Say amen. Amen. And our wonderful God came to rescue us, amen, and took the form of a human being, a baby. I mean, he went through the same process you and I went through, the same process. And uh, I'll tell you what, he was without sin. Sin had nothing to do with him. He didn't inherit, amen, through the seed of Joseph, corruption. Like we have inherited corruption in uh, all the, the things that we have to deal with in life. Fact of the matter is, the Scripture says there is no room for him. I hope you have room for him. Amen. Amen. I hope our, those that are on the web would understand that it's time for you to make room for God in your life. Because God's coming back in the form of Jesus Christ, to redeem this world, amen, completely. But there's going to be a purge. There's going to be great sorrow before that happens. There's going to be tribulation like the earth has never experienced before. But the fact of the matter, those that are in Christ, like in the days of Noah, those that were in the ark, are going to be spared the righteous judgment of God. And believe me, it's a righteous judgment. God came to redeem and save to the utmost those that would trust him, believe him, and follow him. But if you're not, judgment awaits you. Judgment awaits you. The Scripture goes on to say that these uh, shepherds were abiding in the field, keeping watch over the flock by night. They were looking for the predators because they didn't want their precious sheep and lambs, amen, to be devoured by the wolves of this world. And so it is that we have this understanding that they were doing their job and all of a sudden 
the angel came upon them. The angel of the Lord came upon them. And the scripture says this. When the glory of God came about them, they didn't need a campfire. That's my perspective. When the light and the glory of God came around them because the angel of the Lord stepped into their life, the campfire seemed just like a little spark. They got so afraid because it was supernatural. It was a supernatural experience that they were having, something beyond their comprehension. And the angel of the Lord comforted them and said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings. I don't bring you sad news. I don't bring you terrible news. I don't bring you heartbreaking news. I bring you glad tidings, good tidings of great joy. Not just joy, but of great joy. And this is which shall be to all people, not just you shepherds. It's amazing to me that the Lord brought the news by way of shepherds. God always has a way of doing stuff like that because the shepherds, <clears throat> we know that Jesus Christ is the shepherd of our soul, the bishop of our soul. But we also know that God has put pastors in our life, and they are considered an under-shepherd because they watch over the flock. Through the Spirit of God, they keep their eyes on the people of God and make sure the wolves don't come in and take and devour one of us. But the Scripture goes on to say this, it's to all people. And I love God for doing that to me because when I was a little child, I can vividly remember the story when I would sit down in front of my television set and watch the Jewish people go through all their ceremonies and stuff. And uh, I would say, oh, if you were just born a Jew, you would be a special people. Right? Right? You would have to be born a Jew to have the privileges of having the promises of God, of Abraham upon your life. And I remember that as a little child. Didn't understand it, but I envied those that were born Jewish. And then we see that God broke the barrier down, took the wall down, and he said, it's to all people, whether you're Jew or a Gentile, Greek, I don't care what you are from your lineage, you have a Savior that's willing to save if you come to him. Say praise the Lord. Amen. And so that glorious light shined about them. They were afraid and all that, and, but they got good news from the, from the angel. The angel communicated with them and said this after he said it to all people. He says, for unto you is born <clears throat> this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ what? The Lord. To the Jewish mind, to the Jewish heart, they understood completely that there's one God and only one God. Because their spiritual leaders, especially Moses, says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord, your God, is one Lord. One Lord. And so <clears throat> they understood that there is one Lord. You ask the mind of Paul the Apostle before he made his conversion on the way to Damascus. He asked this question when God spoke to him. He said, Who art thou, Lord? And when the answer came back, I am Jesus, it shook Paul's world. He was no, known as Saul of Tarsus at that time, same man. And immediately he said, well, what would you have me to do? He got that revelation. He got that illumination. He understood at that moment who God was. And these angels are telling the shepherds, the testimony is, you know this one being born to you, this son, He's from heaven. It is the Lord from heaven. It is God Almighty. It is the Savior of the world, Christ 
the Lord. How important that is, that testimony from heaven. The scriptures say, Christ the Lord. Jesus Christ is more than the Messiah. He's more than the Savior of the world. He's more than a healer. He's more than one that brings illumination. He is the Lord, the God of heaven. Amen. Stepping into humanity as a human being. And that's why the scriptures go on to express that Jesus Christ demonstrated he was God. And he was crucified for that very reason. Because they said, you being a man, maketh yourself God. And that's blasphemy in, in the Jewish mind and heart and soul of that people. And so they wanted him crucified. But the fact of the matter is, they had it twisted. He was God who became a man. And being a man, he could die for our sins. Being God, he could not. God can't experience death. He's life. And so that's why the Bible defines the difference between deity and humanity, between what God is in spirit and when God became a human being, the anointed Messiah or anointed flesh, that one that walked among us was in fact God himself. Amen. So the Trinity is not a concept that is biblical. And I won't get into it because it's not even worth debating right now because of our lesson. But the fact of the matter is if you would go back to your Bible, and let's just do that to Genesis. It always talks about one God. It always talks. The scriptures go into the thousands and thousands of testimonies about one God. But if you were to go in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, this is where maybe one scripture or two scriptures that this is where the Trinitarian believers, I mean, they get all over this. But the fact of the matter is the very next verse is in very, if you're thinking that God is more than one, then you're thinking wrong. Because the scripture says, and God made um, let me see. And God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creepeth thing that creepeth upon the earth. And they pick out us and our and say, God's got to be more than one. But the very next verse says this. So God created man in his own image, singular. In the image of God created he, singular, him. Male and female created he, singular, them. So is there something wrong with the scriptures that they collide here? No. If you look at the scriptures, the Bible says, and God said in 26, the 26th verse. And in what you see in the 20. Seventh verse, it says, and so God created. And there is a difference. God speaks, and when God speaks, it doesn't necessarily have to happen right there. But when God speaks, the scripture says, it will not return to him void, but it will accomplish what it's been sent to do. And so what we see in scripture is a prophecy. God said, and God said, let us make man in our image and our likeness and let them have dominion. And in the scripture below it says, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. God has one image. And that image is Jesus Christ. So the prophetic word goes out. God knowing the demise of man, that man would fail him, for man is not God. Man is not God. Therefore, the possibility of failure is there. God put man in a paradise situation. 
God gave man everything he would ever need. And God related to man and fellowship with man. And God tested his work and put Adam to the test. Like he put Abraham to the test, like he put David to the test, like he puts you and I to the test. God tests us. Not that he doesn't understand us, understands the possibility of failure, but we need to know who we are in the light of who he is. And Adam rather believed another voice than the voice of the Lord. Adam rather believed his wife and fellowship with his wife than fellowship and believe the God that made him, the creator. And so God, knowing this, spoke into future. Not his future. God is from everlasting to everlasting. God doesn't work and doesn't have the time frame. He's eternal. God can speak into your yesterdays or your tomorrows. Because God is present always. God doesn't have a lineage. He wasn't born. He didn't have a beginning. And he doesn't have no ending. But God made man. And he put man in time and space. And we have ages. Because God deals with his creation as ages. You had the angelic age. Now you have the human age age. And we are to preach this gospel and believe God that he will be with us till the end of the, the world. But the world in, in its real essence of the, of the meaning of the word in the original means age. And when this age is done, there will be a next age. And when that age is done, there's going to be another age. And when that age is done, it will go on through eternity. That's why his government shall have no end. We are in it for the long haul. Amen? Everlasting life. Everlasting life. Thank you, Jesus. Well, I believe this. I don't think God was talking about us as being the angels. I personally think that we had to be redone, reborn. We needed remission. And all those wonderful things that Jesus Christ brought to us. And I think God made us very good in the beginning. He was pleased. But we failed. Well, our father failed. Our natural father. And in doing so, the Lord had to become a human being to save us. That was his choice. To redeem us. That was his choice. And to make us New again. We are now called his what? Workmanship. We are being made again into the image and the likeness of God through Jesus Christ. I believe that. I believe we're being made over in Christ. I believe we are going to be able to grow just like the Bible says that when we experience the new birth and you can't see nor can you enter the kingdom of God without the new birth, when you have the new birth, then you can get that growing understanding and that revelation that just as a child goes through stages, so the spiritual child goes through the same stages. You've got to be born Amen. And you've got to go through them stages into life. How many steps? I think it was Ezekiel that stepped into the realm of God's temple in heaven. And there was three avenues going up to the throne. And to get to the throne, there were eight steps. Eight steps to reach the pinnacle where God was on the, th the throne of God was I believe with all my heart there are eight principles that you have to go through amen to be reborn 
complete. Complete. And so the scripture goes on to talk about this wonderful prophecy and that God was very specific on uh, who the Christ child was, the, the label of approval, and the things that Christ would be and go through were all labeled in the Old Testament. And when Pilate pointed his finger at Jesus Christ, I, I can just picture this. He wanted to know about him. He, wanted, he heard about him, but he wanted to know about him. And he said this to Pilate. He said, to this end was I born. And for this cause... I came into the world that I should bear witness unto the truth. There was so much untruth, lies, and everything out there that the humanity, the people, didn't know who to turn to. They saw the corruption in the political realm. They saw the corruption in the, in the religious realm. They saw the corruption among themselves. And they were confused. They were in darkness. And they needed a light. And Jesus Christ came to bear witness of the truth. Amen. For this end was I born. And for this cause, for this cause, I came into the world. Amen. His, his cause was to set us free, to make us free. Amen. To loosen us from the hands of of the deceiver that originally started in the garden. Well, if Adam and Eve really loved God, they wouldn't have fell. If they trusted God's word and had a good fellowship and relationship with God, they would have never took the word of a deceiver and a liar. But apparently something happened in their life. Nevertheless, God has come back to redeem to save, amen, and deliver us from our sins and trespasses. Praise God. All right, so another scripture, amen, that comes to mind is in 1 John chapter 3, 8. John testifies, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifest. Why was God revealed? Why did God become a human being? That he might destroy the works of the devil. The devil was not always the devil. The devil was Lucifer, the bright morning star, so to speak, in that day, in that age. But he was put to the test. And he failed. And all those that were with him failed. And they were judged accordingly. And had no possibility of salvation. The Bible expresses they cannot be redeemed. They were in the glory and the presence of God. They knew better. But as far as man is concerned, God saw fit that, you know what? I'm going to come to them. I'm going to get in their face. I'm going to express to them, follow me, come after me, seek me. And so those that do, the Scripture says some wonderful things about them. For God so loved the world that he gave, what? His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish. Listen to me. The Bible in Revelation says those that do not believe will perish. They're among the list that's given that will not enter into the kingdom of God. But here it says, whosoever believeth in him should not perish. The believers should not perish if you believe in Jesus Christ. The right way, if you take him at his word, if you believe him and trust him, trust me, he is a savior that can save to the uttermost. There is no problem, amen, his arm is not too short. And they are nail-scarred hands reaching out to you and I. Can you say amen? Amen. And so we have this together here. We understand that the devil lost out. He became a devil, by the way. He was not a devil to begin with. He was created perfect. 
there was a, they were spiritual, and it was a good thing. It was a perfect thing done, but they themselves had the power of choice, just like Adam had the power of choice, just like you and I have the power of choice. We can choose the wrong. And so um, the Scripture goes on to say this, Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. That came out of Isaiah 12, 3. For the kingdom of God is not meat or drink, but what is it? But righteousness and peace and joy, where? In the Holy Ghost. Amen. I tell you, there's nothing better, amen, than understanding the truths of God understanding and obeying the truths of God. The Scripture gives us three testimonies, and amen, how God has given three testimonies in, the, in, the, in, in our lives. Let's just put it that way. I was going to say in the Scripture, but in our lives. You have the word of the Lord going through prophets, the verbal word of the Lord. That's a testimony. And, it, and Israel and even people that weren't even Hebrews, and even before then, understood they got a word from God, verbal word, a word. Then you have the written form, the verbal form, the written form, and these last days God gave his son, and that is the final word, the final testimony. God himself in Jesus Christ gives that final witness of truth to humanity. Now it's just a matter of time, God's time. How whatever long he extends it out in grace, in this age, we have the opportunity today, for now is the time or the day of salvation, the Scripture says. Don't put it off. Don't put it off. Get filled with the Holy Ghost. Understand who God is, number one. That's your foundation. But to be filled with the Holy Ghost, you're going to see better. You're going to understand better because you have the Spirit of God working in your life and illuminating you. And so that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Well, our purpose in life is to seek him, to love him, to know the truth. And understanding that, we grasp the scriptures and we can see that we have to be reconciled. I've got some notes here, and I'm going to close with these. Therefore, if any man, this is coming from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17 through 21. If any man or human being be in Christ, he is a new creature. A new creature, new creation. Why do we got to become a new creature, a new creation? Because we lost that in Adam's fall. And we got to be redone. We got to be made into his image, the image of God. But how do we do that? By getting involved in following Jesus Christ, who is the image of the invisible God. Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. And if you get in his image, you're going to get back into the image of God. And <clears throat> old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. New things have come to us in Jesus Christ. And all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. It doesn't say themselves. It says himself. And so we need to be reconciled. God offers sinners to be reconciled, redeemed, restored, regenerated, with remission of sins, with the renewing of the Holy Ghost, with revelation and resurrection possibility. And they have given to us the ministry of reconciliation, Paul said. The ministry of reconciliation. God wants you right with him. He wants to fellowship with you. But the only way it can be done is through Jesus Christ. No other religion. No other whatever. I'm not going to get into it. There's a lot of religions out there that promise you this, that, and the other thing. But I'm telling you, it's only through Christ Jesus that we can have reconciliation with God. For God has paid the price of our filthy sins, 
Amen. Through the blood of Jesus Christ. Can you say amen? amen? To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself. Not themselves, but himself. Not imputing their trespasses unto them. And have committed unto us the word of reconciliation. In other words, the Lord God of heaven, God Almighty, it came to us in human form and willingly gave his life, laid it down for us, amen, that he can reconcile us back. The thief stole us, and the thief wants to kill us. He wants to destroy us. That's his objective. But Jesus Christ came to bring life and the abundant life to us, amen? Oh, hallelujah. I don't care what color you are, your ethnic background. I don't care if you're Jew or Gentile. Amen. Whosoever, let him come unto me, Jesus said. Whosoever. And uh, I'll just mention, I don't care if you're in Hoosville. That was a creation of Dr. Seuss and where I was born in Springfield, Massachusetts. But to all you... Greenwich is out there, you, you guys that are, and women that are just grumpy, miserable, all that kind of stuff, even Jesus reaches to you to change your heart, to enlarge your heart, amen, and it'd be good for you, amen, to get a good dose of the Holy Ghost, amen, that it'll change your point of view in life, you want to be restored, and God will give you love, and it'll give you forgiveness, and so you will be a new creature in Christ Jesus, all because it was God's idea. It was all because, amen, he decided to come and redeem us, amen, in the face of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Say amen. amen. All right, that's our lesson, and we're going to go into the next part of the service.